Hi everyone, I'm Matt. Uh, good to be back with you. Today we are looking at Matthew 12 verses 22 to 37 and we're looking particularly at the accusation of the Pharisees that Jesus is actually an agent of Satan. And the only reason that Jesus can do his miracles is the fact that he is working through demons. But before we get there, uh, I don't know if you've ever listened to Radio 4. I am, because although I look about 24, internally I'm about the age of a 72-year-old. So I listen to Radio 4 and I listen to a programme called Just a Minute. If you haven't seen it before, the idea is that you have contestants have a minute to talk about a topic. They're not allowed to deviate, they're not allowed to hesitate, and they're not allowed to do something else. But I can't remember what that is. Not particularly important. But in your groups now, turn to you, have a timer on a phone, see who can talk for one minute on the question, who is Jesus? You're not allowed to hesitate. You're not allowed to go off on a random tangent. One minute, who is Jesus? Have a go. So I don't know how you found that. Uh, maybe we found some hidden stars that should be contacting Radio 4 soon. But it's a really interesting question, isn't it? I've been thinking recently, if someone asked me, who is Jesus, could I explain who he is? More importantly, could I explain who he's not? Because there are loads of ideas in our current society about who Jesus is, but most of them are wrong in major ways. And we're going to look at that a bit tonight. But first, have a read of our passage, Matthew chapter 12, verses 22 to 37. As you read through, pick out what's particularly interesting to you, what do you have questions about, and what did you not expect to be in the passage? So a little bit of context. Jesus has healed someone on the Sabbath just at the start of this chapter. Uh, if you know anything about the New Testament at this time, this was seen by the Jews as almost like an arch sin. It was a, the big sin, as it were, that they were particularly hot on. They'd taken a, a wrong view, a wrong interpretation of Old Testament law about keeping the Sabbath and thought that meant you could do literally nothing. Jesus poses the question to them after he heals a man's hand and he says the Sabbath was made for man not man for the Sabbath so is it not right to heal someone on the Sabbath if you have the ability to do it in other words we are not beholden we are not um, slaves to this idea of the Sabbath rather the Sabbath is designed for us to set us free and one of the key things about being human is being able to help other people's suffering. So if we can do that on the Sabbath, we should. But Jesus made the Pharisees even more angry because he called himself the Lord of the Sabbath. In essence, he called himself God. Now in first century, century Israel, this was the worst crime you could commit. This was punishable by death. Jesus himself had committed a blasphemy far worse than any Jew would ever consider doing because he'd made himself equal with God. And we see at the, end of the, uh, at the end of this passage in verse 14, that the Pharisees start conspiring and looking for a way to destroy Jesus. They want him dead. They want him gone. They've gone from earlier on in the chapter where they just want him quiet, they want him out of the way, to now they want to find a way to make him dead. And so this is where we see that accusation coming, coming in, in this passage. If we look at verse 22, again, someone in need of healing comes to Jesus. But this time it is a demon oppressed man, someone who was blind and mute. And Jesus healed him so that he could speak and he could see. Jesus is doing the signs you would expect of the Messiah. He has power and authority even over demons. And everybody sees this, they're amazed and they ask, is this the son of David? Is this the Messiah? Is this the king of Israel, the fulfillment of the Old Testament? And if they were paying attention, is this God himself? But as soon as the Pharisees hear this, they make up a lie. 
to distract people to, from Jesus, to persuade people away from Jesus and to convince them not only that they shouldn't follow Jesus, but that actually Jesus is evil. The lie they make up is that it is only by Beelzebul, the prince of demons, that this man casts out demons. In essence, the only reason Jesus is powerful is because Satan is the one working through him. Now, this might seem a bit odd. To us, it might seem like quite a stretch of the imagination. Surely no one's really going to believe that. But in first century Judaism, where they were well aware of the spiritual world as well as the material world, an accusation of someone being an agent of Satan carried serious weight. But this is also the way that Christians are accused today. You see, the Pharisees didn't have anything against Jesus that they could charge him with. He was doing all the signs of the Messiah. He was showing everything you would expect, saying everything you would expect of someone who is the Messiah. So they had to make up false claims about Jesus to try and turn people against him. And that happens in today's society. Turn with the people in your group. What are the accusations made against Jesus today? You may have heard friends say it. You may have thought it yourself. Maybe you hear it on the TV. What are the accusations made against Jesus today? I wonder what uh, stories and what um, ideas you had about the accusations made of Jesus. I've noticed three particular ones that I've come across. The first is that Jesus is simply a good teacher. He's someone like Buddha or uh, Gandhi or whichever nice person is around today. He's a good teacher. He tells us how to be nice people, but there's nothing more to what Jesus had to say. Now, we've read enough of Matthew. To be honest, even just the first and second chapters of Matthew is enough to prove that that is a lie. Either Jesus is God or he's no one at all and we should stop paying attention to him. The other that we see today is that Jesus is a prophet, that Jesus is a, a man of God, but he is not God. He's come to uh, convey a message from God, but he himself isn't God. And we see this particularly with Islam today. Islam is very interesting in just how much it has to say about Jesus. In fact, it meant the Quran mentions Jesus more than it mentions the prophet Muhammad. And it's so focused on convincing Muslims and non-Muslims that Jesus is not God, but that he is merely a prophet who has come to do great miracles and to convey a message, but nothing more. The final one is that Jesus is misrepresented. And this I, I see particularly happening in churches today. You'll see, or if it's not Jesus being misrepresented, it will be the people around him. There'll be accusations of being sexist, of being racist, of um, any of those kind of isms or isists that nowadays are enough to get you cancelled on Twitter straight away. And so Jesus is slightly misrepresented. Or... It's a case of our understanding of Jesus isn't quite right. You haven't, you don't quite have the knowledge to look at this passage properly and truly understand Jesus. And so there's these subtle ways, particularly within the Christian community, that there are accusations made against Jesus. But the question is, how do we respond to them? Well, thankfully, Jesus responds to this accusation that he's the devil in verses 25 to 29. And it's very interesting how he does this. You see, he doesn't ignore the question. He doesn't say, you clearly don't know what you're talking about. It's not worth engaging with you. He also doesn't go to his own personal experience. He doesn't say, well, I don't believe I am. Or the way I feel when I do these miracles isn't the way I would feel if, I, if the devil was working through me. He actually goes to quite a lot of reason and a lot of logic. He says, a kingdom divided against itself is laid to waste, and no city or house divided against itself will stand. And if Satan casts out Satan, he is divided against himself. How then will his kingdom stand? If you supposedly have one team, but both sides of that team are working against each other to try to destroy each other, that team is going to fall apart. 
The miracles that Jesus is doing are clearly against Satan. He's casting out demons. He's healing people. He is banishing demons into herds of pigs and the pigs then drowning in the sea to get rid of the demons from this particular person. This, and this does not line up with Satan's plan. It doesn't line up in any way, shape or form with what you would expect of a team working together. So he follows it through with logic. He dismisses their accusation, but then he builds them up. In verse 29, he says, How can someone enter a strong man's house and plunder his goods unless he first binds the strong man? Then indeed he may plunder his house. Jesus can't do the things that he's doing against Satan if he doesn't first overpower Satan. Then, and only then, can Jesus have power and control over the people possessed by Satan. Which raises the question, I've been thinking, when people, when I see people come either to me or to other people with these accusations against Jesus that we've talked about earlier, I don't know if I actually follow through the reasoning with them. Have a go now in your group, see if you can follow through the reasoning for those different accusations. And if you couldn't come up with any in your group, Think about the ones I've said, that Jesus is just a good teacher, that he's a prophet, or that he's been misrepresented in the Bible. How would you work through those three uh, accusations to show that they are wrong about Jesus? So with the accusation against Jesus having been dealt with, Jesus then poses what is quite possibly one of the most debated passages in the whole of the Bible. From verse 31, he says, Therefore, I tell you, every sin and blasphemy will be forgiven people, but the blasphemy against the Spirit will not be forgiven. And whoever speaks a word against the Son of Man will be forgiven, but whoever speaks against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven, either in this age or in the age to come. Now, I don't know if you've already discussed this in your groups, but there is a huge amount of debate about what Jesus means in this passage by blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. And we see this pop up in a few other places. In Hebrews particularly, there is the unforgivable sin. But there are a few things to point out here. Notice first, Jesus is addressing the Pharisees. He's addressing people who have hated Jesus and who have, are progressing in their sin. They have gone from wanting to just keep Jesus quiet to finding ways to get rid of him in terms of just socially to now wanting him dead. There's a clear progression and a seriousness and escalation of the sin that we see going on here. They are hardening their hearts against Jesus rather than in being confronted with Jesus, repenting and seeking to understand more. The other thing is that the word blasphemy here actually had a much wider meaning in Jewish culture than it does today. So the, the general meaning of blasphemy was not just against God, but against people. And it meant things like um, uh, defamation or ridicule or hearsay against someone else. So when he says, blasphemy will be, every sin and blasphemy will be forgiven people. Jesus is saying, if you've made up an accusation against someone, if you repent and trust in Jesus for forgiveness, you'll be forgiven. If you have said something callous or harsh about God or someone else, if you repent and trust in Jesus for your forgiveness, you'll be forgiven. But the the blasphemy in mind against the spirit is very particular. It is the, the kind of idea we have about blasphemy now, of it is against God, particularly. And it is, a, it is of a, not just a, a questioning of God, it is an accusing God of evil or a denouncing of God. So there is something about a denouncing of the spirit of God that will not be forgotten. In this pattern, of increasing sin, increasing hardness of heart, and an increasing lack of love for God. 
it can be tempting to brush this passage away because we either say, well, we don't know what the blasphemy against the Holy Spirit is, so we don't need to worry about it. Or we try and make it so particular that we avoid any concern that we might be heading in that direction. But take a moment now to sit with this. Think to yourself, am I escalating in my hardness against God in the same way the Pharisees were? Has that day off from praying or reading my Bible turned into a week off, a month off, a few months off? Have I found myself being harsher with people than I used to be? Have I found myself coming up with more excuses to not be a small group, to not be at church? Take a moment to seriously consider, are we on this path of escalation? Because now is the time, if we hear his voice, to seek forgiveness, to ask, to seek, to knock, and Jesus will forgive us. But there may come a time if we don't take the time to notice and to repent, there could come a time in the future where actually we find we can't repent sincerely. Like Esau, who sold his birthright as the inheritor of God's promises for a, a cup of stew. And then found himself very tearful afterwards, but actually, when he came to think about it, couldn't genuinely repent. We need to make sure that we don't get there. And if you are seriously in that place of thinking, I might be heading down that path, read what Jesus says at the start of that verse. Every sin and blasphemy will be forgiven people. If you seek Jesus, if you ask him for forgiveness, if you knock on his door and don't give up, you will find forgiveness in Jesus for eternity. But if you don't ask, you won't get it. Jesus now turns and gives the reasoning for this. So if we look at verses 33 to 37, this can look like a separate part to Jesus's argument. It looks like he goes on to something else, but actually this is really connected to what he's just been saying. The point of what Jesus is saying here is in verse 34. How can you speak good when you are evil? For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. The good person out of his good treasure brings forth good, and the evil person, person out of his evil treasure brings forth evil. What we say is so important because actually it shows where our hearts are. I've, um, it feels like every time I, I, I give a talk or I, I do something in a small group, I talk about school, mainly just because it's, school's just quite tricky personally for me at the moment. But I've noticed I am grumbling. I'm not grumbling as much as I was, but I am grumbling. And that shows where my heart is. If after a meeting, my first inclination is to grumble about what we've been told or think ah, they don't know what they're talking about or they don't understand what it's like to be in my classroom. That shows that really where my heart is, is a place of grumbling. It's a place of discontent. And actually, it's a place of animosity towards other people at my school. But if the first words out of my mouth are, I can see where this bit was helpful. If I, even if I then go on to say, but I don't think they got this bit right. The fact that the first thing out of my mouth is, this is where they helped me, shows where my heart is. And it's the same with how we talk about God. How readily do you talk about God? How quickly are we to talk about what God is doing or what we've read in the Bible that morning that's encouraged us, that God has used us to fire us on for the day? Or do we not really talk about God at all? Because what we say shows where our treasure is, what our heart is trusting in, what we really want. So spend some time now in your groups, think about what you say. How does it show, or what does it show about your own heart at the moment? And then once you've done this, pray together. Pray that you would have the words to say when someone makes an accusation against Jesus. Pray 
uh, for repentance, for where we are wandering down this hardening that the Pharisees started to go down. And finally, pray that God would give us hearts that love him and that our words would show that.